from the latest on Caribbean cruises to kosher safaris, pilgrimages to Jewish Eastern Europe and award-winning wines and international cuisine in sun-drenched Tel Aviv. Sit back and enjoy the trip with the travel edition of the Jerusalem Post podcast. Welcome to episode three of the travel edition of the Jerusalem Post podcast. I'm Mark Gordon, and this is my co-host and travelling buddy, David Harris. Thanks very much indeed. And today we're going to be fulfilling, to some extent, one of your dreams, which is a visit to exotic India. What is it about India that excites you so much? Well, I've always loved curry. Curry is my number one food. Oh, come on. There's got to be more to it than that. And you can't get a good curry in Israel. Apologies to all the restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> No, I've, I've always wanted to see the Taj Mahal. I've wanted to go to Goa. I've wanted to travel on the train in India, visit Mumbai, just everything about India. In this particular episode, we'll be finding out not only about the things that, Mark, that you just mentioned, but a lot more. And there's particular interest for our Jewish audience on this one. Where else are we going, David? Kensington Market in Toronto. Before we go to those two destinations, why don't we, as we usually do at this point, ask a couple of quiz questions that you can think about and we'll give you the answers at the end of the show. Question number one. How many countries border India? And question number two. Young Street in Toronto is the longest street in the world, arguably, according to the Guinness Book of World Records. But just how long is Young Street? India is home to the second largest population in the world. It's long been a favourite destination for backpackers. But what does it have to offer the rest of us? To find out about its magical charm, we spoke to Jewish tour guide Joshua Shapurka. I am from uh, Mumbai, India. And uh, I have been working as a tour guide uh, for the past 25 years. I uh, I was a licensed tour guide. And then since about six, seven years, I started my own company called Jewish India Tours. And I'm the director of uh, that company. And I belong to a small Jewish population. In India, we have about 3,800 people. The population of India is 1.3 billion. So we are 0.0004% of the population, a very, very tiny, uh, very small group of Jews living in India. But I'd like to add, We've been living here without any problems. Tell us a bit about the tours that you offer. Are they day tours? Are you taking people around the country? Do you just focus on Mumbai? I do day tours. I do day tours uh, for like you know people who come to Mumbai and all the cities actually. And uh, I also do day tours for cruise liners. And I also do tours which are the, the full program as such. A package tour. My representative goes to the uh, airport, we pick them up, take them to the hotel, we do the book, we book the hotels, uh, book restaurants, go share food, and uh, the tours. So we do all kinds of tours. We also tailor make it for, uh, for the people. So you, you write to me, tell me, okay, I have 10 days, and these are my interests. So I will tailor make the tour according to your interests. Can you tell us more about the different Jewish communities in India and what we would see of them on your tour? My tour starts in Mumbai. We cover uh, the history of the two communities, which are the Bene Israeli and the Baghdadis. The popular belief is that the Bene Israelis came here 2,000 years ago and during Antiochus' time, just before the story of Hanukkah. They were coming down south and near the coastal areas around Mumbai, there was a shipwreck. And uh, most of the people did not survive the shipwreck. But legend says that seven couples survived. I don't know why the number seven. And I am the descendant of these survivors. Uh, In the shipwreck, everything was lost. Uh, So with time, they forgot the prayers. But they did not forget a few traditions. That's the Shema Israel, the basic prayer. They followed Kashrut, that is uh, kosher. And uh, they circumcised the, their sons. They were forgotten. They also didn't know that they were Jews. Some say probably in the 16th century, uh, 
or as late as the 17th century. They were discovered by a Jew from Cochin called David Rahabi. He then realized they were Jews, selected a few people, trained them, taught them the religion. And in the 18th century, there was a religious revival with the coming in of the Christian missionaries. The Christian missionaries taught them Hebrew. They learned English. And when it was conversion time, there was a no thank you. And then they uh, migrated to Bombay, worked for the British as soldiers and civil servants. And uh, so in our tours, we basically, in Bombay, we go to uh, like, you know, a few synagogues, which are Bene Israeli, like the oldest one, which was built in 1796 by a soldier. We go to other synagogues and cover the Baghdadi story. Now the Baghdadis, they call the Baghdadi Jews, but mainly they came in from Syria, Baghdad, and Iran. They were called as the Baghdadi Jews because they followed the Baghdadi liturgy. Cover most of the uh, like buildings in Victorian style, Victorian revival, classical revival style. And we also go to the Baghdadi synagogue for Shabbat. After Mumbai, we go to Cochin. Jews are living there in Cochin for more than 2,000 years. And they say that King Solomon's ships came to India to trade ivory, silk, precious stones, even took monkeys and peacocks from India. The community believes 4th century. Some say it was much as late as 11th century. A local king gave the Jews copper plates, giving them 72 special rights. And one of the most important uh, right was that the Jews did not have to pay taxes. Probably that was the only place uh, in the world where the Jews did not pay any taxes. There was another group of Jews came in from Portugal and Spain, and they built a synagogue in 1568. It's called the Pardesi Synagogue, Synagogue of the Foreigners. And uh, it's one of my favorites because uh, like you have tiles got in from Canton, China, uh, chandeliers imported ones. They have uh, Torah crowns full of gold gifted by the Maharajas. We also then take our people to uh, other synagogues in the villages in the interiors of Kerala, built in the 16th, 17th century, which are museums now. After Cochin, we go to Calcutta because it has a very rich history. Again, Baghdadi Jews. Wow. There is so much, and, and I'm sure you have just touched the, the, the tip of the, the iceberg. Absolutely, absolutely. For us on the outside, especially Mark and myself, who've grown up in Manchester, which has this incredibly rich Indian cuisine, I think one of the main things that we think of when we think India outside of the culture is the food. How can a Jewish traveller, particularly a kosher traveller, experience the wonders of Indian cuisine, the, the, the variety that there is there? Actually, you're asking the right person because I call myself a foodie, right? <laughs> and uh, I love the cuisine of, uh, of India. And uh, it's absolutely no problem for a kosher traveler because every street, every corner, there would be a vegetarian restaurant. And you will see that pure, it all, the board will always say pure vegetarian, which means no eggs and no meat products, right? Nothing even made of meat. So it's absolutely kosher. For a Jewish traveler, absolutely, it's not a problem. And uh, it's so varied, our Indian cuisine. Like you go down south, you have a variety of dosas, which are crepes made of lentils. Uh, you have idlis, which are pancakes of rice, steamed rice, vadas, which are again fried uh, donuts made of lentils again. Different varieties of rice. You go up north, you have different varieties of breads, right? Parathas, naans, chapatis. I can just go on and on. <laughs> You're making me very hungry. <laughs> I, I should also just, uh, as an aside note, say, as a, living with a woman who is gluten free, that it's an incredible experience to, to taste, take Indian food because so much is made from lentil rather than uh, wheat flours. Back to the world of, of travel and sightseeing. You talked very much about the, the, the Jewish heritage on your tours, which obviously is our focus. But do the people who come on your tours also have the opportunity to see the Taj Mahal, the Red Fort of Delhi, the, the pink city at Jaipur, that type of thing? Cover the Jewish history. And at the same time, in other these sites, we show them the non-Jewish sites. We go to Jaipur, 
my favorite city, as you said, the pink city, a lot of forts, palaces, you can ride an elephant, uh, and uh, like, you know, the markets are so colorful there. From there, you go to Agra, see the Taj, right? You have to see, if you come to India and you don't see the Taj, you haven't visited India. So you have to see the Taj Mahal. And from there, go to Delhi and of course, see the Red Fort, uh, the Jama Masjid, the old, what we, I love the old part because I, uh, apart from the monuments, I also love the streets, the people. You have to go around the markets, go around the small streets, see the color, feel the city. Uh, so yes, we do uh, the other part too. Joshua, I really want to come now. If I were to come, how would our listeners want to get, get in contact with you? Anyone wants to get in touch with me, you can get in touch with me through my website. It is jewishindiatours.com. My email ID is info at jewishindiatours.com. Not very difficult to remember. Joshua Shapoka from Jewish India Tours, thank you very much. Pleasure was mine. India Fact File Air India and United operate non-stop flights between the USA and several Indian destinations. Air India also operates a direct flight from Tel Aviv to India, flying to Delhi three times a week. El Al flies you from Tel Aviv to Mumbai with its non-stop flights four times a week. India is well connected with North America, Europe and Israel. There are direct and connecting flights operating to all major Indian cities. A prepaid taxi will take you from Mumbai airport to the city centre in around 60 minutes. The price is around 12 US dollars. It takes around 40 minutes from New Delhi airport to reach the city centre by a prepaid taxi. The price is 10 US dollars. Hotels recommended by Joshua. Located in Mumbai's Nariman Point, the Trident Hotel offers a panoramic view of Marine Drive. The price per night for a double room is around 170 US dollars. The Hotel Le Meridian is situated in the heart of New Delhi. Price per night for a double room is around 165 US dollars. The currency in India is the rupee. Rates may vary, but as of January 2021, the rate was around 74 rupees to a US dollar. Chabad House and Knesset Eliyahu Synagogue in Mumbai provide kosher meals on Shabbat. Kosher meals can also be arranged in Delhi. You're listening to the travel edition of the Jerusalem Post podcast. And now it's time for our look at the latest travel news headlines. Royal Caribbean announced residents of Israel will be the first guests to cruise on its new ship Odyssey of the Seas in mid-2021. Tickets are already on sale. We'll bring you full details in our next episode. Lastminute.com has teamed up with Israeli travel company Ista to set up the Hebrew website lastminute.co.il. This is Last Minute's first website outside Europe. El Al is trialling PCR COVID testing for unvaccinated passengers before allowing them to board flights. Passengers undergo a nose swab with results within 15 to 20 minutes. Israel will become the most sought-after destination for American travellers after the pandemic, according to the US-based Travel and Leisure magazine. Qatar Airways is the first airline in the Middle East to try out the new IATA digital passport. Emirates, Etihad and Gulf Air have also signed up for the evaluation phase of the pass, which may become the global standard. Just before Covid struck, I had the pleasure of touring Kensington Market in Toronto. These days it's a rich mix of cosmopolitan colours and eclectic scents. But the area's Jewish history is just as rich as we find out from Sharoni Sibini, who is a guide for the Ontario Jewish Archives Stories from Spadina Tour. I am a tour guide with the Ontario Jewish Archives Blankenstein Family Heritage Centre here in Toronto and it's a a part-time gig for me and the rest of the time I learn and I teach various things and I make ceramic art sometimes so just a variety of different things and for a while I was the manager of the Jewish Life Department of the downtown Jewish Community Centre here the Miles Nadel JCC in Toronto so um, I you know I kind of connected those two pieces the the tours and the jcc work i'm assuming there's 
a rather sizable change in the nature of the Jewish community from what you were just talking to us uh, now about the modern period and when Jews first began to arrive in Toronto. So when did they come and did they come together, as it were? The Jews of Toronto have been here since Toronto was incorporated as a city in the 1830s, but the first sign of permanent settlement of Jewish Toronto comes in the late 1840s and mid 1850s, where you see some evidence of British and German Jews establishing the beginnings of a community here. And so it's a it's a kind of trickle effect at the beginning. And the people who came in those early days um, would have been people who assimilated pretty well into the broader non-Jewish community here. And then what you're interested in, I think, is the third chapter of Toronto Jewish life. So the second chapter briefly would be a concentration of Eastern European Jews in an area of Toronto that no longer is named as such, but was called St. John's Ward and is where uh, our city hall and our giant mall, the Eaton Center are today. And the part that still exists um, that is not a, a Jewish community anymore, but Jews do sometimes live in the market is Kensington Market. And Kensington Market was home to the Jewish community from really from the 1910s through the 1940s. And uh, predominantly in the 20s, 30s and 40s, it became a very densely populated Jewish community of Eastern European Jews. I've been reading a little bit about Kensington Market and some of the pictures have really beautiful synagogue buildings. Were they built as soon as the Jews moved into the area? Pretty soon after. So it takes a few years for people to get the capital together. But the the synagogues that still exist in the market are the Kiever Shul and the Minsker. Kiever to 1927 and the Minsker to 1930 or 31. There were Jews in the market already, and in the case of the Kiva, for example, we have documentation that says that people were renting out homes on that property and then eventually would get enough money together to tear down those homes and turn it into a proper purpose-built synagogue. Was the Kensington market area exclusively Jewish at that period, or was it a mixed community? Oh, pretty much exclusively Jewish. The area was built as a predominantly residential area in the late 1800s, for Scottish and Irish workers, predominantly people who worked in Toronto's agricultural industries, and it was a residential neighbourhood. And it's when the Jews moved into the market that you start to see it develop into a market. So they started kicking out the front walls of their buildings and of their homes and turning them into storefronts and turning their front parlours into storefronts, and, and then it started to develop the character that it has today. And in those years, it was almost exclusively Jewish, if not exclusively Jewish. I had the privilege of of being in the area a couple of years ago, had a great time. But outside of those synagogues that you've mentioned, I didn't feel that the area was at all Jewish today. Are there still Jewish people who live there or, or have they just moved further uptown? So mostly people have moved further uptown and that migration started in the 40s itself and then moved on like in the post-war years. But there are people who live downtown who identify as Jewish. Um, Not necessarily. There there are a handful of people, I think, who are pretty observant, but most observant people live uptown. And um, the people who live in and around Kensington Market are you know, variously attracted to the market as artists, intellectuals, people with a commitment to a downtown urban pedestrian kind of life. And they're not necessarily super observant, but they are connected to Jewish life in different ways. Now's the chance for you to plug your tours. What type of things can people see on the tours? One thing that's particularly interesting to me is that we like to show people how the market is structured. So we're looking at the domestic life of the market, the, the, you know, how people turned their residential spaces into retail spaces, what kind of shopping patterns, what kind of food ways people would discover in Toronto. Um, and you can see that it's still really a bustling market. It's really got the same kind of feel and landscape to the area, the era that we're describing on the tour. So the Jewish community left a blueprint for other communities that have subsequently come into the market. And for about 100 years, that market has been a real immigrant absorption neighborhood. And it's been well preserved because there are a lot of historic protections on the area. People really fight for the vitality and the character of that neighborhood in a way that uh, admittedly maybe Torontonians haven't fought for other parts of historic preservation in Toronto. It's a city that tends to erase its architectural history pretty quickly. So it's a pretty cool neighborhood, um, a pretty vibrant neighborhood still. And one of the things that will that's a real privilege is that we get to take people inside the Kiever Synagogue. It's a beautiful space. So people get to explore 
the sanctuary space and uh, get to see and you know feel what that space would have been like 100 years ago and how it's still functional today. Um, we talk a little bit about the heterogeneity of the community. So we, you know, even though we're in a synagogue and it's an orthodox space, we're looking at uh, also the rise of the working class um, socialist left, right, or communist left, um, all of the secularist movements that would have affected people. So we're really interested in the proximity of how people lift their lives, the tightness of the concentration of all of the different aspects of their lives, the religious life, the working life, the, the domestic life, all of these aspects would intersect. So if someone is coming to Kensington Market, what else is there to see outside of the, the Jewish heritage of the area? It abuts Chinatown. So you can hang out in Chinatown, which is also an, in a non-COVID era, a really exciting place to be. And it's got a lot of character too. And within walking distance of Kensington Market, there are all kinds of tourist attractions. It's not a far walk to go to that big mall that I mentioned earlier, the Eaton Centre, if shopping is your thing. Um, and then, you know, it might be a short streetcar ride down to the CN Tower. Uh, it's within walking or streetcar distance of art galleries and museums and sports venues. Um, it's really close to the University of Toronto's beautiful central campus. I'm a little partial because I'm an, an alumna. And, uh, you know, in the neighborhood itself, there's a lot of food to discover if you're not kosher and um, not so much food to discover if you are kosher. Unfortunately, there are no kosher shops in the area now, but really you can explore Chinese food and churros and, and pinatas and all kinds of things. And there's a really fun shop in the market or there has been, I haven't been down there in a few weeks, but a place called Rasta Pasta, that's Italian Jamaican fusion. So a lot of shops in the neighborhood are really interested in exploring the intersections of different food ways too. If you do keep kosher and you come to the area, firstly, is there good vegetarian food? And secondly, how far away is the nearest kosher restaurant? I can think of a place called Hibiscus or King's Cafe, a couple of places in the market that are not kosher, but they are definitely vegetarian. Um, I think, I, I can't remember if they're vegan per se, but everything is accessible by public transit in Toronto, which is great. But the concentration of kosher restaurants in the city has shifted northward and a little bit westward up a street called Bathurst now and so Bathurst would be your main touch point and there are, I mean if you go online you'll find tons of kosher restaurants listed but it'll take a little travel to get there. If our listeners want to get in contact with you and take your tour how would they do that? The best way to do it is to get in touch with the website to explore the website itself so if you go to ontariojewisharchives.org org there is a lot of curated content on the website. Um, you can explore the holdings that we have in the collection. And of course, you can reach out to the organization directly through the website and book a tour or explore the possibility of a private tour. So there are lots of ways to connect. Sharoni Sibony, it's been great. It's been fascinating. And uh, hopefully people who've been listening to this will be in touch when they're visiting Toronto. Thanks for your time. Terrific. Thank you. Fact file for Kensington Market in Toronto. Air Canada has flights into Toronto from most major European cities, Tel Aviv, Los Angeles and San Francisco, while Air Canada Express and Air Canada Rouge cover most United States and Canadian cities. El Al flies direct from Tel Aviv. A taxi from Pearson Airport to Kensington Market is around $55 and a limo $60. Union Pearson Express runs from Pearson Airport to Union Station in downtown Toronto in just 25 minutes. Adult one-way fare from Pearson to Union is $12.35. A further bus is required from Union to get to Kensington Market. Totally Jewish Travel lists more than 80 kosher restaurants in Toronto. The nearest to Kensington Market is King David Pizza. The currency is the Canadian dollar and 100 Canadian dollars worth 77 and a half US dollars. Expensive hotels include the Hazelton in swanky Yorkville from $470, more boutique the Kimpton St George Hotel also in Yorkville for $133. Besides City Hall and the Eaton Shopping Mall, the Marriott Downtown is $117 and the Fairmont Royal York in the Financial District boasts history. Even the Queen of England stayed there from $180. We'll give you those all-important quiz answers in a minute, but first I'd like to say a big thanks to Joshua Shapurka and Sharoni Sibony for their contributions today. If you liked our show, 
please give it a five star rating on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever else you're listening to us. And please leave some very, very nice comments for us. And as Mark promised, it's finally the quiz question answers. Our India question How many countries border India? The answer is eight. They are Pakistan, Bangladesh, Myanmar, or as it used to be called, Burma, Bhutan, China, Nepal, Afghanistan, and Mark, Sri Lanka. But by how much is Sri Lanka adjoining India? Apparently, it's only 0.1 kilometers. Sri Lanka's an island, but there's a little stretch of land that joins them up together, and it's 0.1 kilometers wide at the border. Question two. Young Street in Toronto is the longest street in the world according to the Guinness Book of Records. But how long is it? Young Street is 1,896 kilometers long, or 1,178 miles, which makes it more than four times longer than the whole of Israel. And it runs from the lake shore in Toronto to Rainy River at the Ontario-Minnesota border. That's it for this edition. As we say, please, please give us your comments because we only grow and learn from where you would like us to visit on the travel edition of the Jerusalem Post podcast. Podcast.